is, is running. Okay, uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome back uh, to the CSC 50th anniversary e conference and exhibition at 2021. Uh, this is Reza. Uh, I will be your MC for today's uh, session. Okay, uh, as you know, today is the day three, and uh, this uh, today uh, we have a dedicated session to discuss about what are the best technologies and practices for Asian steel industry. And just now we have the first session, uh, we have a special session from uh, Seri, and the second session, which is now we are, uh, will be holding soon, uh, this is a session from CBMM. And for your information, Seri and CBMM are our uh, diamond sponsors. And on the third session, we will be having best practices on strategies and selection for steel products. And the fourth one, last but not least, we have a best plan management and supply chain, uh, the excellence performance. Okay, uh, now the special session that which will be conducted by CBMM, that the main focus on uh, the session is on niobium delivering sustainable uh, HSS solution for construction. And this session comprises of ultra low and low uh, niobium, ADO uh, slash NPO real case examples and sustainability uh, slash trope. And for uh, today's session, we have three speakers uh, here. Uh, the first speaker, uh, Mr. Tiago Costa. Mr. Tiago is the managing director from CBMM. And the second one is uh, Mr. David Harita from uh, CBMM as a senior technology manager. And last but not least, uh, Dr. Patel from International Metallurgy Limited as a director and consultant. Okay, I think without further ado, I will hand over my presentation to any of you. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Let me share my screen now. Uh, I hope everyone can see my screen at the moment. Is that okay? Not yet. Right, so, uh, good morning, everyone. I would like to start congratulating uh, CIZ for the 50th anniversary. CBMM is joining uh, CIZ, I believe, for the 11th uh, year at the moment. And uh, we are really glad to uh, join this conference for uh, those many years. It has uh, been adding value to our company uh, as well. So I'll just uh, like to make a quick introduction about uh, CBMM. This is an overview of our um, uh, industry site. I, yes. You're not sharing your screen yet. No? Yeah. Oh, just one second. Then. Okay. Can you see it now? Yeah, perfect. Ah, okay. Sorry about that. So. Okay. So in this case, I'll, I'll restart again. Uh, just uh, this is the overview of a CBMM site where we produce our ferro niobium products and other niobium based products as well. We, CBMM was founded in 1965 and so uh, since then we are investing in niobium technology to our uh, customers mainly focused on the steel industry. Uh, today, the main three sectors that CBMM, CBMM and IOBIUM can make a difference is on the mobility, infrastructure, and energy. Uh, they, uh, the solutions are related to sustainability, safety, and more efficient uh, solutions. CBMM has a global presence uh, in all the continents and 
uh, we have the offices based in Singapore. That's the one responsible for Southeast Asia, uh, Korea, Japan, uh, India, Taiwan, and uh, Oceania. And we also have subsidiaries in Europe, North America, and our headquarters is uh, in Brazil. Um, part of our strategy is to have Niobium products distributed in warehouses, strategic warehouses, based on where the customers and the majority of the consumption of Niobium is located. So we have a strategy to keep at least two months inventory in the warehouse plus uh, one to two months in transit to the warehouse. So we make sure that Niobium is always available to all the customers. CBMM is the only company uh, that produces Niobium, that produces all kinds of products. So we have Fair Niobium, the one used for steel industry. We have Niobium Oxides that is vastly used for glasses applications, solar panels, semiconductors, electronics, and now electric vehicle batteries. Uh, Niobium Metal for MRI and uh, other special uh, applications like sputtering targets and uh, particle accelerators. And vacuum grade alloys to use on the aerospace and oil and gas industry. And uh, today, the session, we will be discussing why adding niobium makes a difference uh, in the world, right? Uh, we'll cover new and better properties, uh, performance, and also cost benefit. We all know that cost is something that is really important especially for emerging uh, countries uh, producing steel. So in this session, we are going to go cover uh, one of the main applications of niobium. So in our program, we have mobility, energy, structural segment, and others, which includes aerospace, oil and gas, and uh, other applications. And today we are going to focus on niobium applied to structure. So uh, Dr. Patel and David Jarreta, they will cover uh, some topics related to cost benefit, like alloy design optimization, ultra low niobium, and we also cover some sustainability uh, points as well. So I would like to hand it over to Dr. Patel so we can proceed with the section. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Tiago. Let me know if you can see my screen, Tiago. Yes. Great. Thank you very much. So, uh, the uh, I've got two presentations uh, this morning. So, um, the, the first presentation I have is on cost savings with ultra low niobium additions in 355 or, or less than 355 uh, structural steel. So this is uh, what I'm talking here is more about uh, commodity grade steels. And the uh, purpose of the presentation uh, today is really to highlight how ultra low additions of niobium can be used in these commodity grades to save uh, manufacturing costs without any changing to rolling conditions. Uh, this presentation will give some background information uh, on the metallurgy and the uh, the concept of what we're terming ultra low niobium, and uh, part of this then will be followed through by uh, David uh, Gioretto, the second speaker, who will give some more details into the cost side uh, of this and the operational side of this. But so the first presentation that I'm giving here is more about the background uh, technology and some of the science behind it. Um, so copies of these presentations that we're giving uh, can be made available. And um, if people are wanting uh, more information on this, then certainly we will be available for a short Q&A, hopefully afterwards. Um, but also our emails are, are on here. Uh, so please do contact us through the uh, through online or, or through the, the chat forum on the conference website. So it's just some background information. We know that the global steel market uh, is about 1.8, 1.9 uh, billion tons of steels and about 50% of that go of steel produced actually goes towards construction or infrastructure uh, of some description 
And uh, I just wanted to really put it into perspective that, uh, you know, that's a significant amount of the market uh, with regards to steel and therefore uh, revenue and margin and product type that's being produced. And in particularly in the ASEAN six countries, we know that construction is a very uh, important part of uh, the steel industry and steel demand uh, within the uh, ASEAN region itself. So out of that uh, 50%, so approximately 900,000 tonnes, uh, just to put it into perspective, uh, we forecast that about 140 to 150 million tonnes of this is for beams and sections, and uh, which is about 16%. And uh, there'll be another 24% on top of that, which is actually rebar alone. But when we just look at sections, for example, that has a market value of about 120 to $130 billion in today's value. So a significant uh, uh, valued product uh, for construction, even though most of it is commodity grade steels. So when we look at the market, we know that uh, the majority aren't classed as high strength steels and or very high strength steels. And here I'm talking about steel strengths here, as you can see here, from 185 megapascals to 275 megapascals. Um, we know that uh, there are a lot of countries outside of the ASEAN 6, in particular Europe and North America, that do uh, use a lot of 355 megapascals in, in strength. And uh, we'll be talking about this a, a bit later on, uh, where value can be created by going to the least higher strength steels, uh, both for steel makers as well as uh, the end users of steels. We know that in order to make uh, these higher strength steels from 185 uh, strengths upwards, and particularly 275 and 355, uh, the base composition of these steels is, is carbon, manganese, and uh, silicon. Uh, silicon mainly being through the uh, steel making process routes. And therefore, to make these higher strength steels, uh, steel makers would generally adopt a, a policy of adding either higher carbon, but most of these steels are around 18%, 0.18% carbon, um, and therefore, go down the path of uh, ever increasing manganese content. So typically for 185 megapascal steels, we'll see manganese content at very low levels, uh, about 0 0.4 to 0 0.6. And as we progress to 355, that manganese level will gradually increase um, significantly in some cases to levels of about 1.2, 1.4 in some cases. And as we go to heavier products, um, which is thicker steels effectively for sections, um, and plate, for example, then again, the chemistry is also further increased to make the properties, as you can see here. The other option steel makers sometimes have is, uh, is as we move to 355 sections, is not only to increase the manganese content, but also we do see uh, small additions of microalloying elements, uh, typically vanadium, and occasionally we do see niobium being added, and this is more so for the 355 uh, megapascals. The issue we have with uh, this side of, as we increase the weight of the steel um, and also the strengths, is that these additional manganese costs or microalloys uh, are additional costs to, to steel making. So one of the things which uh, it, it, we've noticed and, we, and you as steel makers have experienced certainly in the last uh, six months, if not longer, since August uh, last year, is the increasing price in raw material costs. And these two charts here show over the last 24 months, the price in, very, in three major regions of China, EU and North America of increasing ferro-alloy costs of um, ferromanganese silicon and here uh, vanadium. And so this is, these alloying costs effectively will eat into the margins of steel makers, and in particular, if you're reliant on commodity grade steels, 275 uh, and even 355, then increases and in, or any volatility in this will also have an impact to your overall operational costs. So it starts becoming important for us to understand uh, the importance of how we use these ferro alloys uh, in the best uh, way possible to optimize our return on them. So the proposition in this particular case here of uh, ultra low niobium and what I'm talking uh, about ultra low niobium is things uh, niobium additions of what I'm terming 80 to 100 parts per million so 0 0.008 to 0 0.01 percent um, and this is what we're terming ultra low and the the proposition we're making here uh, is that 
from some research we've done and some industrial trials, which I'll go on to show the results, uh, we, we, we have found that uh, very, very low levels, these ultra low levels of niobium can be used in 275 to substitute manganese and save uh, costs in the current climate. And also for some of the lighter sections of 355, the same thing can be done, either a partial or full re uh, re partial replacement of manganese or a full replacement of uh, the vanadium addition that's been made to these steels. For higher strength or heavier sections of 355, then the additions of niobium is slightly further increased uh, and we start entering uh, where niobium is used as a mi typical microalloying element, which we, we all um, know very well. So very, very quick overview on some of the, the basis of the mechanical properties. We know that when we, when we make steels, we are rely metallurgically on a number of different uh, mechanisms. That's being solid solution strengthening. So this is typically what we'll see from manganese, silicon, uh, phosphorus. Uh, in these commodity grades, the reliant is on manganese as a element. Uh, we then have a uh, whole pitch relationship, which is the ferrite grain size. And then we have dispersion strengthening, which is perlite, which is more reliant on the uh, level of uh, carbon that's being added to the steel. And then finally, precipitation strengthening, which is either from niobium or vanadium. But at these commodity grade steels, it's important to stress that these precipitation strengthening part is, is considered quite low with its strengthening contribution because we're adding very low levels in here, and particularly with the case of niobium. So these are the major four building blocks that we rely on to give us the target strengths that we're targeting. Now, this graph shows the uh, solid solution strengthening contribution of manganese, which we are all accustomed with. And the equation that you can see at the top is a predictive yield strength equation uh, developed by uh, Gladman. And it's, it's quite well known in Pickering. And what it tells us is that 1% manganese addition gives us roughly 32% 32, sorry, megapascals in strength. So in all reality, manganese is um, a required element in steel making. However, as a pure solid solution strengthener, it is uh, not as efficient uh, because you have to add 1% to get 32 megapascals. And, but we do also know that the addition, the, the other additional benefit of adding or contribution of manganese on the strength is that manganese does depress the AR3. So this is the transformation point from austenite phase to ferrite phase and additions of manganese uh, have been proposed that one percent will drop the ar3 by 80 degrees centigrade and uh, so it acts very similar to uh, water cooling when we uh, leave the rolling mill and on the runout table or if there's any water air mist water cooling it depresses the transformation temperature and it accelerates the transformation process once that ar3 point is reached so manganese the additions of manganese um, makes uh, a similar uh, mechanism as uh, water cooling would be uh, doing. Uh, and this graph just shows that. But again, uh, it's an expensive way to trigger this, uh, this, this, uh, this mechanism uh, to develop a finer grain structure. So these are the two things which I'd like us to bear in mind um, of what manganese does. And also because it helps with solid solution, but also manganese, as I said, it depresses the AR3. This graph shows uh, for, a, for a vanadium based steel, plate steel, how the precipitation strengthening, which is here in red, and in this steel, the precipitation, the vanadium content is 0 0.15, so very high levels. But as you can see, there's a saturation point um, as we go to higher manganese content on a base composition of 0 0.5. So at about uh zero point as about at about 1.2 percent manganese here so at that point seven here on the graph um we can see that there's a saturation limit reached and that is due to this uh, adjustment in the transformation in the depression of the ar3 so uh we we have to also bear in mind uh, all of these secondary factors when we start playing with uh the alloying content and in particularly the manganese content as well that after a certain point uh, it also starts to limit how much precipitation strengthening you can get, in particular here for the manganese due to the phase transformation itself. So with regards to niobium, what we're suggesting here is that this is a very typical graph of where uh, niobium benefits on the recrystallization stop temperature, where we start to produce pancake grains and to give us the very fine grain structures 
uh, that we're accustomed to when we think about niobium. But what I would like us to think about and look at for this presentation is the very bottom left of the graph where I've, where I've, where you can see this blue shaded area, which is called ultra low niobium. So this is an area which is typically not associated with niobium. And what we've been finding is looking at this graph in a lot more detail uh, and, and researching this over the last eight years, uh, what we found is that at very low levels of niobium, there is significant potency and significant benefit which can be seen, which we've not really typically looked at because traditionally we've associated niobium at much higher levels and also low, rolling at very low temperatures as well. And what I want to show you is that this is, we also need to look at niobium in a slightly different way uh, in commodity steels where it still can play a role. So this graph here on, you can see, and I'd like you to focus on the blue line, which is the recrystallized austenite grain. Uh, and this is really when we finish at high temperatures and when we have low niobium additions. And it typically tells us that as we refine the recrystallized austenite grain, it can still lead to a refinement on the ferrite grain size, uh, which you can see here on the blue, blue line for the right axis. So if we can refine and make a smaller recrystallized austenite grain, uh, even with very small additions of niobium, it should give us contributions in strength. And therefore that would allow us to decrease uh, the strengthening contribution that could be made from alloying additions of manganese and vanadium. And this graph, I'm not gonna put to, for too long uh, due to time, but this will be available to you um, as, as I said at the presentation. Also uh, details of this were given in last year's CIASI pres uh, presentation that I gave as well on this. So the paper's available. If not, please get in touch and I'll be happy to pass that on to you. But it shows that at very low levels of niobium here, you can see delays in um, fraction recrystallization. And this just shows that even at higher temperature of a thousand degrees, the top graph finishing, we'd still see a delay in recrystallization. And it's this mixture of delaying the recrystallization, but because we're finishing hotter, we're still having niobium available to precipitate, uh, very similar to vanadium, to give us a very small fraction of precipitation strengthening as well. And these two points will give us that extra strengthening even at these ultra low niobium additions. The graph here shows the benefit of niobium compared to vanadium and typically we'll have niobium providing twice the amount of uh, strengthening contribution um, compared to vanadium. So again there's a benefit here from using very low levels of niobium as you can see here. So to give some industrial examples these are two section sizes I've given, two sections, sorry, I've given, 355, where uh, one was typically alloyed with carbon manganese vanadium and one was then done with ultra low niobium. And you can see here that using, um, and these are commercial examples, and you can see here that in the current market conditions, we can save $8 a ton using an ultra low niobium uh, addition or $11 a ton for that particular manufacturer. And there was also subsequent savings in global warming potentials because we're overall using a lower content of uh, raw materials from the alloying perspective uh, and that part of the the, the uh, GWP uh, I'll be talking in my second presentation uh, this morning but you can see that here th there are significant savings to be made under the current climate and uh, particularly because of ferroalloy prices of manganese and also vanadium are, are at high levels and continue to be going in that upward trajectory and so here just summarizing that by adding 100 ppm or in the lower case slightly higher at 140 ppm niobium we're able to substitute some degree of manganese and vanadium uh, when this is without making any changes to the rolling conditions it's purely uh, a change to the alloying uh, mix itself and this is uh, uh, examples of another commercial trial that was, was done with a client of ours in, in China, in particular this was, where we managed to go down to 75 ppm niobium and compared to their uh, 100 ppm vanadium composition. So they were already using very low vanadium levels. We were able to then look at reduce, getting rid of the vanadium, adding even lower niobium levels because of the potency of niobium. And in this particular case, again, we were able to save about um, 70 cents uh, to the ton um, because they're making over a million tons of this types of products, commodity products, the, the savings there are quite apparent. And what was also interesting to see was with this particular example was that the low temperature performance 
the Sharpie impact values are also very good. And you can see here from the bottom, the mechanical properties are comparable to their original commercial um, alloy design. What we found was we managed to quench a sample of this steel uh, straight after rolling just to look at the microstructure. And what we found was that you could see that the um, aspect ratio was near one. So we weren't getting any pancaking, which we wouldn't expect because we're finishing quite hot typically for sections uh, near a 950 degrees centigrade. Uh, but what we did find was the uh, distribution was uh, slightly to the left. So it meant we had a narrower uh, distribution and a finer uh, grain size that had been recrystallized, which then led to slightly higher, the increase in strength, which allowed for the reduction in manganese content and also the vanadium content. Uh, and also interestingly, when we did low temperature Sharpie properties, you can see in this blue line here where the red dot is, the Sharpie properties actually were very good and it almost made a very low uh, temperature uh, product here, which is not what was intended here, but we could almost reach 27 joules at minus 60. So again, this was a, a very positive bonus aspect of uh, the addition of niobium in, in able, enabling to do this as well for the customer. So I'm not going to talk about this too long here, but what we've got in this presentation, which you can have, and I said it's in the paper, is we've created, I've created a set of guidelines which allow you to have an idea of the total savings that you can make uh, in alloy uh, content as you want to decrease the manganese content. And I'll just uh, run through this quickly. So this is for an example of 0 0.15 manganese. If you want to reduce the uh, manganese content as 1.2, it gives you an idea by following the, the red line as you come down and then dropping it down how much drop in strength you will get from the reduction in manganese. So in this case, by dropping it by 0.3% manganese, we go from one to two. And that on our chart means that we're dropping about 30, 25, 26 megapascals. In order to get the same strength, we go to the top here, which is the niobium addition, and we read down and then we ins intersect the green area here, which is the strengthening contributions from niobium. It then tells us that typically we would need to add about 60 to 80 ppm. What we're saying is you really need to look around 80 ppm because from a steel making point of view, um, reaching very, very low levels on a consistent basis we know is challenging, but around 80 ppm we believe is about the right mark to substitute about 0 0.25 to 0 0.3 uh, manganese content. And what we found is that as you go to flat products, this is extended more. And as you go back towards more longer product sections and bars, uh, that is slightly less. And this is due only due to the processing uh, side itself of steel making. And similarly, there's a similar, there's a different chart here that we've put together for vanadium. Uh, and as you can see effectively here, niobium is uh, twice, has twice the potency of, um, of vanadium. So we're able to, to, to sort of literally make half that addition. So this summarizes the sort of reductions in alloying content and the strength drop that we're expected if you took out say 25 manganese here or the 20 vanadium and what the what the addition of uh, 100 percent 100 ppm niobium so the ultra low niobium addition how that would compensate with respect to price so you can see here in these three examples there is net savings to be made ranging at the moment from 1.8 dollars to even 3.5 dollars depending on how you uh, substitute the manganese and vanadium content. So the final remarks I have uh, for the first presentation is, uh, you know, you need, we need to, as steel makers, I'd like you to really ask these three basic questions is, do I make steel grades between 275 and 355 megapascals? Uh, is my manganese content greater or equal to 0 0.6? Do or do I use vanadium up to 0 0.6? 0.3%, so 300 ppm uh, vanadium. And if the answer is yes to any one of those three questions, I would really urge you to have a look at this presentation or get in touch with us because we believe that um, with our research that we've done uh, and also with uh, trials we've done, uh, recent trials we've done, uh, commercial trials with customers, we believe that there is an opportunity here for you to save money by using 80 to 100 ppm niobium and these ultra low niobium additions or slightly higher at the more conventional niobium levels, but still low to do partial replacement of vanadium and uh, manganese and to save money. And also importantly, save on raw material costs, um, which is contributing towards uh, you know, sustainability and the global warming potential figures here. 
Um, as you can see here, the average is what we're finding is about $8 a ton at the moment in price and uh, 34 kilograms per CO2 equivalent per ton of steel uh, in savings. So on the right, you can see if a steel manufacturer was to adopt this philosophy and concept to a million tons of steels, these typically are the sort of sums of money and raw materials and CO2 that could be saved. So we're not talking insignificant amounts, uh, in particular when we consider these steels are effectively commodity steels on what's being produced day in, day out, in and in large volumes, and in particularly in the uh, ASEAN six um, countries. So with that, I'd uh, like to thank you uh, and uh, I hand the, book, hand, the uh, hand the presentation over to my colleague, um, David. Thank you, David. Thank you very much, Jeet. Sharing. Can you see my screen well, Jit? Yes, it's coming on through. Okay. Over to you, David. There we go. Okay, good morning, everyone. Thank you very much for the opportunity. I would like to continue my colleague Jit Patel presentation by going further on the opportunities, uh, mechanisms, methods, and especially to show some industrial commercial cases of cost reduction and production stability that we have been working on. Starting with the overall cost analysis and how the total cost of ownership of steel production has been every day more and more important for the profitability of the business. Uh, I believe it's no, now very popular to use the total cost of ownership to have an attempt to understand the overall distribution of the cost and especially how can we manage to reduce our costs right and the direct stand that we have in raw materials and variable costs such as fair alloys as well as what we can save on the process itself as productivity increase has become more and more important towards that i think all all of us uh, steel professionals, metallurgists, uh, we have to ask ourselves, how can we reduce costs? How can we be more effective and more productive? And specifically CBMM, we ask ourselves, how can niobium contribute to the overall cost reductions? We are the biggest niobium supplier and niobium technology partner in the world. So we need to find a way of niobium to do that. And as uh, Dr. Patel just explained, we found several different ways. One of them we call alloy design optimization, where as it was ex uh, very well explained, niobium can lower the manganese addition for commodity carbon manganese grades with very small amounts, ranging from 60 to 100 ppm, for example, or for even higher strength grades, uh, other elements such as vanadium, manganese, chromium, titanium, nickel, molybdenum can be reduced or redistributed by a correct addition of niobium, which can change the strengthening mechanisms in a way that you can actually reduce the costs. On the processing side, we like to use niobium to work on the increase of productivity and also on the production instability that can be achieved by a better balance of the strengthening mechanisms leading to higher production yield. In both cases, the alloy design optimization or the niobium process optimization, the objective is to reduce the overall cost by achieving equivalent or improved properties with a lower cost. So all the presentations and everything that I'm gonna show in this presentation, in these slides and cases, are all cases where we achieve the equivalent or even improved properties, which is usually true for toughness and ductility related properties. Our alloy design and process design optimization can be implemented independently or simultaneously. And in many cases, what we could see was a synergy between both process and alloy design optimization, bringing even further cost reduction or productivity increase or improved yield. Starting with the alloy design optimization, as my colleagues showed before, we can see a trend on the increase of, of alloy costs, not just in the recent times that we've seen a, a big hike on all alloy prices, but along the years, you can see that vanadium and manganese have a fluctuation. And recently, 
to, on, on a positive increase on their on their overall cost, which makes producing structural steel more expensive. Therefore, we designed a method that we use the current chemical composition, the process parameters, the mechanical properties. We analyze and we run simulations, and we then design an industrial trial. Right? We trend we tend as much as possible to avoid. Uh, laboratory phases because usually it slows down and we need to be fast to capture the market variations. So we define a trial, we run a trial, we analyze the results and we do a validation and standardization. It's important to mention that most of these projects of alloy design optimization, they have a very low level of risk because the uncertainty is very small. We are usually working within the specification limits and we're doing small changes which do not usually require so much concern regarding the achievement of the specified properties. And as I said, the, the, the idea with niobium is to rebalance the strengthening mechanisms. Uh, and usually what we do is we reduce the amount of strength coming out of solid solution strengthening and precipitation hardening. And we increase the grain refinement and grain size homogeneity effects on the mechanical properties to rebalance the strengthening mechanisms. And by doing that, we usually achieve this improved or equivalent mechanical properties and allows us to play with the addition of other elements such as carbon, manganese, vanadium, nickel, titanium, and several other elements. Showing some microstructures on the figures showed by Dr. Patel, as you can see, the austenite grain size prior to transformation are strongly affected by niobium. Even by 50 ppm addition of niobium in a 0 0.08 carbon steel with finishing temperatures above 1,000 degrees C without any TMCP, right? It's a very high finish rolling temperature. You can still see an influence, on a positive influence on the refinement of the austenite grain size. As the album grows higher, you can even see the recrystallization stop. But with higher finished rolling temperatures, what we see is actually a grain refinement. In the case number one is a published materials. As you can see, there's a source and I'm very happy to share with you the publication. It was done uh, in China to reduce the cost of an EN355 plates, which was initially up to 30 millimeters thickness. And I will show you that we could even improve and increase the range of that chemical composition up to 50 millimeters. It was a carbon manganese steel with 16 carbon and 1.4% manganese. And the manganese was reduced to, uh, reduced to 0 0.9 weight percent manganese by the addition of only 100 ppm of niobium. As you can see in the bars graphic, the mechanical properties are very, very similar. The, there was no change in process conditions in the first trials, and we could manage to reduce the manganese even further for following trials that we actually changed a little bit the cooling strategy. But even in air cooling, the mechanical properties were safely achieved, and we could manage to get more than six US dollars per ton cost reduction by reducing the manganese. And of course, overall, considering the niobium cost as well. As you can see, the plates were very beautiful. There was no problems with flatness or surface or anything. These are also published pictures. And the conclusion is, on top of, of course, achieving safely the mechanical properties of strength, uh, ductility, and toughness, uh, the, the, the material had a much lower cost of, you know, a low cost. And we did have a little bit of extra cost that I'll show later on the steel making process that we could manage to find. And also some cost that we could not calculate that was somehow intangible for us, considering the information we had, which was on the slab inventory and process yield, because we had one single chemical composition that could make plates for three different plate mill configurations because this company had three different plate mills. 
up to nine different plate grades related to the same strength range and up to 50 millimeters thickness all using one chemical composition that increased uh, considerably the yield of the continuous casting because you have no more transitions left when you change the chemical composition and that gave the company uh, a very important savings in slab inventory cost since implementation this concept already produced more than two million tons and it's commercial it's fully commercial this is a calculation that we had on the extra benefits or side benefits of reducing the total ferromanganese addition. Right. In, in the beginning, this chemical composition had 1.4% manganese and no niobium addition. And due to the manganese cold addition, the thermal allowance is reduced. Therefore, you need to increase the addition uh, of temperature or, or heating up the steel, the molten steel, with the use of electric power uh, graphite electrodes. And that would, it was spending about 59 cents of a dollar per ton. As you added 100 ppm of niobium and could manage to reduce the total manganese addition, the thermal allowance was enough without the use of the electrodes to run the heat in the correct temperature for transfer of the lead. That saved 60 cents more on top of the six dollars per ton that we had before increasing to 6.69 us dollars per ton, per ton savings this is also not to mention the quality improvement that we had by lower ferroloids uh residuals contamination especially phosphorus from the ferromanganese the high carbon ferromanganese contains an important amount of phosphorus and especially the internal quality of this lab due to alloy segregation there was an important an improvement that we see because I think it's well known that the reduction of the manganese improves the solidification path so you can have more diffusion during the liquid to solid transformation uh, leading to less uh, alloy segregation as you can see. On the weldability of the final prod prod product you also have an improvement because as you could manage to reduce the manganese your carbon equivalent is lower which leads to an improvement of the weldability of the same steel with the same level. Case number two was done in Gerdau, North America, also published. And it was a direct replacement of 0.03% vanadium, which was done with a target of 0.015 niobium, actual of 0.017 weight percent niobium. Considering the current alloy prices, that would give us 3.41 US dollars per ton, replacing uh, for H beams, channels, and sections, uh, you can see the mechanical properties are very um, equivalent, very much equivalent in all different products that were uh, tested. And this company is currently using niobium in these products. And uh, I don't have the amount of tones, but it's commercial. Case number three, also grade 50, ASTM, H beams, and channels. Uh, also in Gerdau, North America, but it's a different product published in AI Stack this year. Uh, different grade with slightly lower carbon. The, initially, only the 0.045% vanadium were, was replaced by 200 ppm of niobium, generating 7.6 US dollars per ton cost reduction. And further on, we could achieve like slightly higher strength level than before so we could manage to reduce the manganese as well which brought not only cost reduction but also a better microstructure control for improved what uh, u to tensile ratio using the same 200 ppm of niobium no vanadium and only 0.9 weight percent manganese we could manage to achieve 12.89 us dollars per ton cost reduction which was a very impressive and at the same time even improve the quality of the final microstructure as you can see in the pictures case number three uh, sorry uh going to niobium process optimization um the first question we need to ask is that would would an iobium addition manage to improve our productivity and the answer is yes right the answer is yes we can reduce the total rolling time. 
And it's important to mention that this concept is not meant to conventional was rolled, conventional rolling. This is meant to control rolling and TMC tissues, which currently already use niobium or which uh, do not use any microalloy, but target uh, a reduced uh, fi finished rolling temperature for toughness purpose, for example. What niobium can do is, due to the very strong effect of niobium on the crystallization process, by slowing down with even interrupting the crystallization from happening, niobium can de help design the rolling process to be faster, reducing the delay time between roughing and finishing, or sometimes reducing the total rolling time, increasing the rolling speeds in a way that you can have a higher productivity to produce the same amount of tones and save costs. Niobium is also known to have a stronger effect when higher reductions per pass are done. In other words, we can reduce the total amount of passes and increase the reduction per pass, of course, respecting the limitations of the machine, of the equipment. But that could also lead to more homogeneous microstructures and at the same time, a more productive rolling process. In summary, what we're trying to say is that some controlled rolling, no microalloy products could be shifted to as rolled or conventional rolling by adding niobium, and some current TMCP products, such as high strength structural steels, API steels, can be shifted to an optimized TMCP with higher productivity by applying the NPO concept. The first example is an X80 pipeline steel producing a plate mill. And the first alloy design had 0.056 niobium with 0.05 vanadium addition. And the productivity was about 84 tons per hour by respecting the amount of niobium, the recrystallization process for a proper TMCP of an API, high strength steel. And that mill, did not operate at a full capacity and considered the total cost with that productivity too high. So the engineers of this company were forced to redesign the alloy to reduce the total rolling time and try to improve the total tons per hour. And that was done by removing the vanadium and increasing the niobium to 0.085 addition they could manage to increase the productivity to 107 tons per hour. That gave them 8.4, 8.4 US dollars per ton total process cost reduction, already considering the higher niobium cost. I did not even put in this calculation the reduction of an agent, okay? It's, this is just niobium versus process. So it's 8.4. In actual cost, the overall cost, this product was even more uh, interesting than 8.4. This is an API X70 produced in a hot strip mill. Uh, of course, the productivity is much higher in a hot strip mill, and it was produced with 0.06% of niobium, and with the productivity of 287.5 tons per hour. The increase of niobium to 0.085 could manage to roll it faster, reduce or eliminate the holding time between passes and optimize the roughing passes to lower amount of passes and the distribution of the reductions in a way that you could manage to increase your productivity to 513.2 tons per hour, bringing a 6.28 calculated cost reduction, but actually our customer reported approximately $7 per ton, which is pretty close to the calculation, but better. Case number three is the 355JRJ0 uh, chemistry, which used to be completely carbon manganese, no microalloy. It used to have a 78.8 tons per hour productivity. This is a very interesting case because this company used to operate full capacity and they're not allowed to roll uh, the whole year long. So they have a limited amount of months of the year that they can produce. So everything they produce more or every productivity improvement 
uh, is just margin in their pocket. And in another thing specific about this mule is that they have a high production of lower than 30 millimeter thick plates, which is very important for this concept because the lower is the thickness, the more amount of passes you have to do, the more the NPO can improve your productivity. And in this case, a 200 ppm addition of niobium could manage to produce it completely conventional rolling. No control, no delay, full speed to basically the limit of the reheating furnace, which was about 220 tons per hour, bringing an extremely expressive savings of 45 US dollars per ton. And the customer reported a profit increase of about 47 US dollars per ton. This is an extreme case I know, but I like to show it because it's a real case. And many plants that do not operate, do not uh, uh, roll the whole year long or that are operating full capacity right now can benefit in a very expressive way from NPO. Talking about the production stability and basically the synergy between ADO and NPO, these are really good examples of, let's say, side benefits that can come when you use both concepts at the same time. These graphics here, each single point of these graphics is a plate produced along uh, 12 months in a company. And as you can see, uh, on top, you can see the tensor strength and the, the line underneath is the yield strength. The graphics on the left side is the vanadium only with 0.02% vanadium added still. The graphics on the, on, on the right side is the niobium only produced with 100 ppm niobium addition. Both of them will have basically the same average for tensor strength and yield strength. But the variation is what makes the big difference here. As you can see, the niobium ones, because of the balance, the, the improved balance of grain refining and precipitation hardening, better than the vanadium that is strongly dependent on precipitation hardening, the niobium can manage to achieve more stable results, generating much less uh, downgrades or even uh, 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 discard of a product due to variation of the mechanical properties. Therefore, overall in a year, this is cost reduction. So smaller variation or production instability can be translated into cost. Another great example of that comes from Baustil producing automotive sheet this is a 420 HSLA grade uh, for cold rolling. And they still used to be produced with 400 ppm titanium addition due to alloy cost reasons. And the graphics, you can see the points in gray show the titanium stew and its variations of tensile strength. And these two was changed to a 200 ppm niobium concept and you see that the variation of the mechanical properties along the length of the production coil is a lot smaller. This is translated into elongation as well. And these two used to have a 20% rejection rate due to low elongation. And after the change for niobium, that was reduced to 5% total, considering all different types of quality issues. And even the niobium concept with the alloy cost being slightly higher than the titanium cost, the overall cost was reduced by 1.54 US dollars per ton. This is a great example on how alloy design optimization and process design optimization can have a synergy to bring improved cost by production yield or process stability. So in summary, the niobium, can contribute to reducing the overall cost by allowing alloy design optimization for reduced direct spend with alloying elements, and also enabling process cost reduction with the niobium process optimi optimization, improving the productivity, the production stability, and the yield. On the quality side, niobium can generate a finer microstructure and enable alloy design with improved weldability, and allow also the use of alloy design for improved quality with more homogeneous and more and finer microstructures. And this is how we as CBMM believe that we can also contribute for the overall cost reduction by using niobium and using its properties to 
reduce the overall cost of producing steel. So this presentation was done by me and my colleague Douglas Downheim. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. Good. You take over thank again? Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, David. Can you let me know if you're seeing the screen, David? Yeah. I am perfectly. Great, thank you. Um, so this is the final presentation um, in this uh, special session before I um, hand it over to, to Tiago Costa uh, to, uh, to make the closing remarks. So you heard my presentation first and uh, now you just heard from my colleague, David uh, Gioretta, who's um, given more substance to the processing side and the concepts of alloy design optimization um, and the process optimization um, or uh, cost optimization as well. And for the, for the closing part of this uh, special session, I wanted to bring the focus back towards um, sustainability and looking a bit more at higher strength um, steels as well. So this is looking also then at 355 and uh, above towards 460 uh, megapascals in yield strength. Uh, as I mentioned, we know that in uh, ASEAN countries uh, and including India and China, um, and there are uh, that the use of steels is is predominant, especially in construction, but also most of these steels are, are very low strengths. Um, and we I wanted to hear I wanted to hear highlight uh, the benefit of moving to higher strength steels, both from a structural perspective, uh, as well as a, an environmental uh, perspective as well. And we see these uh, advantages of microalloyed steels or higher strength steels uh, being being used in um, in Europe. Uh, in America and, and also in, in some very uh, tall and, and buildings uh, and increasingly so in, in China. And certainly we're anticipating uh, significant growth in this area uh, in China but due to their recent policy requirement that they've announced in moving away from more commodity or more uh, volume production of steel to more quality orientated uh, production of steels. And also they're focused now towards um, sustainability and uh, raw materials and here within this presentation, I'm gonna hopefully give you some background into that and some examples here where we can see savings, not only financially, but also uh, on the sustainability, environmental uh, side of things, which is again, we know an, an increasing um, important area which we need to uh, pay attention to. So I'd like to show in this presentation benefits going uh, to higher strength steels for the built environment and also then show, give some showcase examples of that from an environmental and a cost perspective. So for the built environment, uh, there are a number of key uh, issues that always come to the forefront and we talk about, which is how we are going to sustain population growth and internally uh, the growth of mega cities, which we see in ASEAN countries, uh, in India and also in China, how all of this is going to be sustainable in a long-term basis, um, how the products we make and the buildings we make and structures we make can operate in a range of environmental conditions. Uh, and that includes both, I'm talking about uh, nature as well as uh, the economy uh, into this and whether these materials can be flexible and also affordable. So these are some of the key touch points which we always look at and address when we're looking at materials for the built environment. It's just to put it into perspective, I just wanted to show here uh, where we are with a population, global population of about 7.8 billion people around today. And if I can extend that out to 2,100, uh, so 80 years from now, the population is going to be about 11.2 billion people. So an awful lot of people on this small planet of ours. And to highlight that, um, I, I just put in here some mega cities in, in, the, in the ASEAN countries of combined population. So this is the, the wider district metropolitan district areas of where uh, as well, covering Jakarta, Manila, Ho Chi Minh and Bangkok. And it just highlights that, you know, if the population forecast, and here I've used a, a forecast tool and looking at an average growth rate of population from 1.2 to 1.3, 1.35%, depending on the, the country or the city. And we can see that the growth rate is phenomenal. 
and that is you can on the, the the columns on your right on the dest, uh, uh, density uh, per people per kilo, per square kilometer you can see here there's inc incredible amounts of pressure that we put on with the resource we have a uh, resources we have and also of land usage so we're going to have to go up or down with regards to the way we build in order to accommodate uh, these large population growths, especially in these um, mega cities that we're seeing uh, arising today. Um, you know, a recent number I looked at was, um, I believe, uh, Mumbai will be something around 60, uh, we'll be almost over 70 million um, by that, by 2100. Uh, uh, um, and you know that's that's the equivalent size of the UK currently where I'm based. So it just puts into perspective the size of growth that we're going to face, and that we're going to have to have the infrastructure in place to accommodate all of these people we have. And I just wanted to highlight that um, in the UK we we're, we're we're pretty unique in some ways with respect to the amount of steel we use in our structures, and this may be an indication of what the the future could be looking like in a number of areas in a number of other countries as well following this trend the steel becomes uh, more and more used in uh, the infrastructure development so this is the uk steel market of uh, multi-story market of non-residential so this is office complex or multi-resident use so offices shops uh, apartments etc and uh, what it shows is that in the uk we're about 65 percent um yeah, with our use of steel in this in this type of area compared to other competing um, and, and complementary materials. And also I wanted to point out that in the UK, we are using most of these steels that are being used are 355, so a grade 50 or, or equivalent strength. Um, there is very little 235 or 275 uh, used today uh, in the industry. And even from the steel makers here in the UK, um, if you wanted to go and buy some 275 structural beams, then that is not available. It'll be made almost to a special order and there's a premium attached to that. So the industry has learned to use steels, have learned to use 355 steels um, well over 20 odd years ago. And that is now our workhorse, our mainstay of our construction industry. And we're also now starting to see slightly higher strength steels being used as and when required. And I'll give some examples uh, of this as we go forward. But I just wanted to give the snapshot here of what this could look like uh, in, in other countries in five to 10 years time, uh, hopefully uh, sooner. So these steel products, uh, my colleague was mentioning, uh, and I was talking about typical applications, as we can see, are uh, for sections, uh, as roll sections, fabricated sections made from plates, uh, hybrid girder systems, uh, hot rolled um, um, strip that's then converted to uh, hot formed hollow sections whether it's tube or square and all of these products are readily seen in the world around us today when we go out and they can be used from high-rise buildings from columns lateral stability systems bracings transfer beams etc to long span structures which is airport stadia stations that type of things to bridges so everywhere we look in our infrastructure in our built environment we see steel and we see all these types of products which can typically be from 275 as we've seen in some areas the 355 as we're seeing in europe and north america to slightly higher strengths uh, for applications certainly in tall buildings uh, and, uh, and and those examples there and i just wanted to put it into perspective from a development point of view when we talk about high strength uh, even 355 uh, it, some people sometimes think it's it's a, a new steel or a uh, steel that's um, just recently being used, but you can see from this development chart here, uh, 355 was developed, and you know, it's been around for an awfully long time, over over 60 years now, and uh, we can see that today you can even have uh, 1300 megapascals um, being made, 1100 is is there, and the um, we have our material specification requirements from our code. So in Europe we have EN 100025. Um, which allows up to higher strengths to be made up to 690. And uh, we're also seeing equivalent changes being made to uh, in Europe, certainly the Euro code, which is the EC3, which is what the structural engineers will use um, with regards to the materials they are allowed to really use and check um, for, for building. So we can see that the, the, the ability for steel makers to make this is there and the market to, to take it is there. And we're also seeing that from the application side, structural engineers are now having more 
access to these types of material and the coding also allows these types of higher strength steels to be used so hopefully we can see this transition uh, take place in the in our sector for structural steels so what are the benefits of going to higher strength steel so this is 355 and above um, and then there'll also be challenges which which i want to highlight because it's very important we look at these challenges and see how we can overcome them or where the limits are of what we can do with these types of higher strength steels of 420 460 690 megapascal so when we go to higher strength steels as we would expect we can um, downsize in weight uh, these structural elements very similar to as we see with the automotive industry uh, where the automotive industry is using more and more higher strength steels, which has allowed the cars to become lighter, become more fuel efficient, and also improve, in some cases, their crash performance. And so very similar with these higher strength steels for structures, the same principle applies. We're able to use a higher, a lighter structure, a lighter, a thinner plates or a thinner section, lighter section um, within bounds of the structural integrity of the, uh, the building. Um, but because say if we have a tall building we're able to use a lighter sections and uh, particularly the column the vertical columns we're then able to reduce the foundational requirements as well for these structures which means that there are cost savings to be made both on the steel used for top side so above ground and also um, on the foundation so there's time savings to be made there's material cost savings to be made there's fabrication costs to be made because you're welding thinner material and transportation is then limited uh, reduced sorry um because if you're only requiring to transport less tonnage from the steel maker to site or to the fabrication site again that savings to be made there uh, cost of erection so that's lifting and craneage uh, you may not need to hire or have uh, larger capacity cranes and so overall we can see that there is reduced environmental footprint and also in some cases by going to higher strength steels it also gives greater architectural scope for designers essentially you can have things such as larger spans you can have greater floor to wall ceiling heights um, you can reduce the column sizes so your floor space index area is increased and uh, there are significant benefits to be gained not only for the steel maker but also for the supply chain and the end users and yes there are challenges involved and as we go to much higher strength steel so even if we start approaching 690 and and higher yeah, there are limitations of what we can do and there are challenges but there is research and i'll show some examples here that's being currently undertaken uh, looking to address all of these things um, and to see where we can use these higher strength steels as and when required in, in a structure so as we know if we go to higher strength steels uh, the yield to tensile starts to to narrow so we start to approach one because of the types of microstructures that we're depending on to get these higher strengths and therefore the reduced uh, work hardening potential uh, comes into play here. We know that the elongation on these steels also starts to decrease. Um, but when we're talking at 460 level, uh, there's not too much uh, effect here and impact. And so um, again, we can go from 355 to 420 to 460 without really having any made too much of a difference in the performance behavior of these steels um, and, and coming to these sort of more stricter restrictions of uh, yield to tensile ratios or fracture requirements um, the codes do mean uh, the codes currently um, do building code sorry do um, restrict in some cases how high we can go in the strength of the steels because it, it enforces uh, designers to use higher buckling curves and there are greater fracture toughness and fatigue in particular requirements typically what we'll find is that as we go to very high strength steels fatigue generally uh, becomes the governing criteria which limits how high we can go in strength but as I said Going up to 460, generally, we don't see that as an issue. And we're actually seeing 460 being applied to many um, structural projects uh, today in the market. So this just gives uh, a schematic here of, of the stress strain curve behavior as we go from 235 all the way up to four, uh, six, 460 and 690. So you can see that, yes, there is a, a, a slightly less elongation. Uh, in this particular case, it's called a strain. And we can see the work hardening potential also um, is, is decreased. But overall, the stress strain behavior uh, remains the same. And there isn't too much difference as we go from 235 to 345 to 460 in the main, as I have uh, stressed. So, a little bit of uh, um, information on the structural side of things. This just shows you a chart which is on uh, column buckling for high strength steels 
from 235 all the way to 690. And what it roughly tells us is that as you go to higher strength steels, it effectively means that we can make the structure more slender and we can therefore rely on slightly higher strengths as we go uh, to higher strengths, higher strength steels because it allows a more uh, loading capability so we can reduce that, that the size. So these are the sort of buckling curves which the structural engineer will use uh, based on the codes and that will give them an indication of uh, how high in strength they can go depending on the slenderness requirements of that particular element. And when I'm talking about a particular element, I mean uh, a section size um, uh, component, for example, in a building. So there are advantages to be gained in going to higher strength steels, but before, uh, higher than 355, before I go into that, it's also important to stress that for plate in particular, where it's being made, uh, converted from fabricated plate to box sections or, or, fab or hybrid girder systems, it's important that there are savings to be made on cost as well as environmental when we go from a normalized plate to uh, a micro alloy plate, which is an M class delivery condition. And what this graph here shows is that by going to an M rolled steel, a thermomechanically rolled steel, we're able to, and by using niobium, we're able to reduce the carbon equivalent. And by doing that, we're able to then means from a fabrication point of view, we may not be able, we may not need to apply any preheating conditions. Uh, and therefore that will save significantly on setup times, gas, energy, consumables, et cetera, and fabrication. So from a delivery perspective, moving from a normalized to a micro alloy thermomechanically rolled product has significant benefits, not only for the steel producer, because we're not, we're not having to do a second heat treatment in normalizing plate, uh, we could just produce the as roll thermomechanically roll plate or strip uh, and, and sell that. And for the user, they're not having to go through all of these issues of they may face with preheating and post wild heat treating uh, requirements. If we're able to go to 460, both again, looking at the N and M, we can see here that we're able to go from a hundred millimeter plate in an example here down to 73 millimeters. And this is the typical uh, trend that you see with as you go in plate thickness, the welding costs start to increase significantly. So if we're able to reduce this by going to a higher strength steel and going from a normalized delivery condition to a M delivery, a thermomechanically uh, deliver, a delivery condition, then there are significant savings to be made throughout the chain. To give you an idea, here's a comparison from a 355 all the way to an 890 uh, steel where we've got material costs. So as we know, as we go to higher strength steels, um, the cost of the steel goes will slightly go up from a steel maker's perspective and a, and a market perspective, but the volume, the, the tonnage of steel, it will naturally decrease because you're having a thinner section, the lighter section or a thinner plate. So this is reflected here in the blue bar chart uh, and the green, you can see the welding also reduces and your welding costs overall reduce as well. So you can see here as a snapshot, it just gives an, an illustration of the savings that are made across uh, the board by going to higher strength steels. So to give some examples here of case studies, this is a, uh, a project which CBMM uh, and I was uh, fortunate to be involved with with Arup here in the UK and it was a tall building that was built a few years ago in Mexico called um, Reformer 509 and this was a 240 meter tall building um, about um, 60 floors and this was on a very narrow footprint. So you can see here the picture on the groundworks, extremely small uh, footprint to put this tall building on. Uh, so quite a slender design. And this initial building was designed with a grade 50 to a 355 uh, um, steel through for the main uh, structural elements. And we undertook a study with Arup uh, to look at what this structure would look like um, using a higher strength solution, if it was at all possible and going up to grade 75 actually in the investigation. So there's a detailed paper on this uh, and, and a presentation, a separate presentation. So get in touch with us and we can forward this on to you. Um, but essentially the structure was looked at in its various in its various components. And the diagram there on the right is the floor plan, one of the floor plans. And what we had was a number of perimeter columns here where you can see the steel reinforced concrete columns. And these vertical columns here, you can see here, really constitute the bulk of the steel that's being used in this structure. And depending on how this structure was restrained at every first, every floor or every third floor, also altered 
uh, the amount of steel that was going to be used. But these were the main areas which we focused in on to have a look at because they were steel intensive and therefore that's where the majority of savings could be made. And what we did was we looked at a number of different uh, restraint conditions and also looking at strength grades up to 70 KSI uh, in strength. So 420, 480 types of uh, strength. And we modeled, uh, or Arup, I should say, modeled the structure, uh, how it would look under various conditions. And Mexico being a seismic country, a seismic city, uh, we also uh, did the earthquake modeling as well for once in a lifetime uh, major earth catastrophic earthquake um, scenario. And what we found and what they found was that it was possible to make use of very high, uh, high strength steels up to grade 70 and even 75 in some cases without any major changes to the overall design. And that led to significant savings being made uh, on the steel. And as you can see here, depending on how the floors were restrained, we could save uh, different amounts. But on the steel reinforced concrete columns so the vertical columns on this structure, we were able to save you know, 14 to 20 percent on that particular part of the steel, which is reasonably significant. And the advantage of that was that it allowed the, the, the square column to be reduced also in size. And by doing that, you create more floor space area. And because this building is 60 stories high, you multiply that gain by 60. And for an owner of a structure, that's significant additional floors effectively from a rental income point of view. So there are significant benefits to be gained by going to higher strength steels where possible in the design, if it allows uh, economically for the operator of the structure. So just to summarize, looking at grade 50 to grade 75, which was the maximum we looked at, uh, we could save um, uh, around 22% on average compared to the 355 um, in weight. And the equivalent costings in today's money for the steel alone was about 600 to 650,000 US dollars for this structure. Now, this cost savings does not include delivery conditions of transportation, uh, savings we made on fabrication, like I said, on welding, uh, transporting from the fabricator to site. So you could almost double this cost. And also you've got the environmental savings uh, to be made there as well. And uh, as a second study, we, we also, uh, Arup also looked at the connections because often we, we, we also, well, when we're making structures, they're being connected by, um, in this particular case, plates, uh, gusset plates, and there are significant connections to be found in all buildings. And we also then have to look at where savings could be made and if savings could be made here by going to a higher strength solution. And again, in this particular example, they looked at grade 50. Here you can see here and combinations of grade 50 and 70 and grade 70. And again, we could see that there were savings, there were savings to be made, sorry, excuse me, go back. Savings could be made here of about 20%. So again, there are significant savings uh, by and advantages by going to a higher strength steel uh, for that tall building. The other example here is uh, again, a, a study we did with Singapore uh, sports hub stadium with uh, Arup in Singapore this time and this was again after they were building or at the time they were building the Singapore Sports Hub and we we engaged Arup with a project to look at a what if scenario if they built it with a higher strength steel for the dome structure which is a retractable dome um, and what it would look like so you can see the sort of tonnages we're looking there 7,600 tons for the total fixed roof uh, the movable part is 1,200 tons so significant amount of weight here and uh, if saving if this could be made lighter then there'd be significant savings to be made not on material cost but also the overall design and the construction part itself so again a similar uh, approach was taken looking at the various elements looking how they behaved from a structural point of view with the various buckling curves here and looking at whether we have hot finished or cold finished coal formed hollow sections so in this particular example they were they were using uh, cold rolled and some hot formed um, hollow sections. And here we, we then looked at the what ifs of going to a higher strength hot formed hollow section all the way up to S500, which is, and, and which are materials that are available in the market at the time of construction and are available today. So these aren't you know anything new. And what they found and what we found was that by going to higher strength steels, there were savings to be made in the structure 
and also you can see here from the the two graphs is that the green line here uh, showing the uh, weight utilized um, as you go to much higher strength steels then the utilization starts to come down so there's an optimum and a sweet spot of how high strength you can go both from a structural point of view um, because the structure was governed by fatigue but also you can see in the graph on the right the embodied co2 and the benefits that could be made so what we found was around 500 megapascals is about the sweet spot where we can see that the number of elements governed by fatigue is about 10 percent. so it's within acceptable uh, parameters where it's not too much of an issue we can adjust those uh, elements and the weighted utilization is also at a good level above 55 percent but importantly the co2 emissions and the embodied carbon also starts coming down and we can reduce the uh, the quantities of steels that we're we're making so overall by going from a hot form 355 to a sorry cold form section to a, a 355 to a hot form 500 uh, hollow section we were able to save about 21 percent if that project had gone ahead and done this and uh, a maximum saving of about 1300 tons of steel so significant savings in tonnage and i think it's fair to say when when we sat with arab and uh, looked at the results coming through they were surprised at how much benefit they could have had with savings in material costs and labor etc all of these things and it, in particular the environmental side by going to 355 and a product as i said which was on the market and it and is on the market today um so it just goes to highlight that as steel producers sometimes you know even our users um are not aware of the benefits that could be made by going to these higher strength steels um in their in their usage and uh i think the final example of the stadium structure is here uh, and again there are various case studies here on this this is the friends arena stadium uh, in stockholm they looked at uh, this is mainly for truss designs here as you can see there on the left and they looked at various high strength steels uh, going from 235 to 460 which again going through the same sort of process led to weight savings about 35 percent in weight and just to summarize that um, for that structure which ended up using higher strength steels um, they were able to have savings of about 17 percent in weight savings almost 15 percent in costs and about 17 percent in per kilograms uh, per ton of co2 uh, savings and you can see there that in tonnage it's about 580 tons of steel that was saved and the cost of that was about 2 million euros so you can imagine for a something like a sports stadium uh, that's a significant cost uh, savings to be made and the environmental footprint you can see there there were savings of around 900,000 kilograms of co2 equivalent so real savings to be to be had here within uh, our users of steel and that brings me on to a little bit on the life cycle assessment the lca and these are just some results that uh, from a recent project that just finished this year that we were involved with uh, and i was participating on behalf of cbmm called strobe stronger steels for the built environment this is a european sponsored project that was for around three and a half years 1.5 million euros and it just concluded the reports available there through the steel construction institute so there are some web links there for you to click on uh, later and it basically we looked at a number of higher strength steels and looking at the solutions of that from a uh, sections in a hybrid girder point of view uh, but it just again shows here as you go to 460 higher strength steels were able to reduce the weight of the structure and make significant benefits and this was an example for horizontal floor beams um, for, for for more most buildings to look at the lca we use the cntc 350 uh, approach uh, that's a standard methodology which is being used in the industry to look at uh, the embodied carbon savings and the all the way through from raw materials all the way through to end of life recycling and a number of uh, scenarios were looked at here you can see on the right there were various design scenarios of nine by nine grids all the way to a 10 story and 20 story building and then also a final case study with one of our partners which was the berlin museum which is a live study that was used and we looked at different scenarios there of what it would look like with higher strength steels being applied greater than 355 uh, both costs and environmental uh, savings and in all cases there were savings to be made from 18 to 48 percent on weight and cost savings up to 14 percent 
and carbon savings you can see from 6% all the way up to 45%, depending on um, one of those case studies that was being used. So this is a very, very strong message and a positive message, which we need to be giving the, uh, the wider structural industry. And this just gives a summary of a tall building, uh, sorry, a residential building, uh, 20 story that used 355 versus S460. And you can see here savings on weight, costs uh, to be made and benefits in uh, global warming potential. So again, highlighting all of these things that are being uh, savings that are being made by going to a higher strength steel usage. And again, in costs, um, as I showed in my first presentation, there are uh, the same data here of cost savings and environmental savings by, by changing the alloy system. And just to put it in perspective, what this means is those sort of savings, so even altering, this is for 355, altering the chemical composition, we were that 37 grams of CO2 equivalent per tonne to 58. Um, you know, I'll go, just go back one so you can see here. So these is the same 355, but using the ultra low and a low niobium approach, you, we're not only saving costs because of the alloying uh, and the substitution that we're seeing that niobium allows, we also see the, the environmental saving because niobium is, is, has a much lower carbon footprint from, an, from a production point of view than vanadium uh, and uh, manganese as well. And what that equivalent, because 37, or 58, what does that mean from a, a, a kilogram CO2? And it, and it equates to 95 miles or 146 miles in an average passenger car. And this is just for one tonne. So you can see that if this is multiplied uh, by steel mills, for example, um, there are significant environmental benefits to be made here on the GWP. And finally, I know there's a lot of information here being presented, and I'm aware of that, but there are a lot of material available online and here's uh, an example uh, of a link to the steel construction institute who we work with very cbmm works with through our uh, technology program quite a bit there's a high strength steel design and execution guide which is freely available uh, it's for structural engineers but there's a lot of stuff there which is relevant to steel makers as well and people that are interested in understanding the properties and the sustainability aspect side of things so i encourage you to get online and download that and feel free to distribute that and there's other useful resources such as this for uh, welding uh, this is a guide that's produced by the british construction steel association this is a a, a, a guide which you can purchase it's not doesn't i think it costs an awful lot there and it's for steel construction and uh, that covers 460 uh, welding as well and i can also direct you to our own site the web then we have www.niabium.tech on here there's a whole uh, list of case studies and examples that both I've presented and spoke about and also my colleague David has spoke about. So I encourage you to go on here. There's lots of case studies on there for you and reference documents to do uh, for you to access all, all free um, uh, and widely and available. And so with that, I know we're running a little bit short on time. Uh, I shall hand over to Tiago for the final comments. Tiago, over to you. Thank you, Jit. Uh, can you hear me well and see my screen? Yes, you're good to go. Yes. Um, so I would like to thank uh, CIZ for this opportunity of uh, having this presentation. We had a lot of questions on the chat and our team uh, is answering that. Since we are running short of time, I believe we will have to address them uh, personally to each one of them. But um, just to finalize, we would like to show a little bit on the, the niobium uh, numbers, uh, for example, in 2019, uh, the total niobium uh, market today is about 120,000 tons. And uh, CBMM technology program, which means what we were doing here uh, today is to disseminate this knowledge at no cost to the end user. So CBMM uh, invests a lot uh, in R&D but mainly for R&D together with our customers. So 1.64% of our revenue is invested in projects with our customers. Uh, so today uh, we have 208 projects running uh, worldwide. 137 of these projects are partnerships with customers and end users. Many of these examples uh, presented today by David Jahed and Dr. Patel uh, is uh, a part of these partnerships 
with customers and users, university and research in institutes. So uh, just to finalize, uh, CBMM is always uh, very concerned and uh, working ahead of time in terms of uh, the environment. We, uh, CBMM is the first mining company in the world to be certified in ISO 14001. And uh, just to uh, highlight uh, related to the greenhouse gases uh, protocol program, if you compare niobium, vanadium and manganese, there is an enormous difference in the life cycle analysis uh, done that. So I believe apart from all the cost benefits that you can have, you are also uh, contributing to, uh, uh, to the green, to redu reduction of the greenhouse gases. With that, I would like to thank everyone for the attention. And uh, if you have further questions, please, uh, uh, we can contact us. And also uh, during the chat, we will be addressing everyone of them. Thank you very much.